uh, scouting for small grain insects in the winter time is what I want to talk a few a little bit about. Is uh, a couple of different insects that we are concerned about. We're concerned because of the aphids, primarily because they are spreading a bad disease called barley yellow dwarf virus. And we're also concerned about hessian fly uh, because it is a chronic uh, pest and, 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 and can be a problem. Now, these insects, while they are different groups and in, in, belong to different taxonomic groups and are not closely related and damage the plants in different ways, they're very similar to the point that they have multiple generations per year and the warmer it is the faster they grow so in a, a years with a warm winter we could have extra generations of aphids we could have an extra generation of the hessian fly so um, they're similar from the from from the standpoint that they are active whenever the weather warms up enough so later on this week we go we're scheduled to be in the 70s so we can easily have these insects developing there um, I think their lower thresholds are probably around 50 degrees or something. So anytime the temperature is above that, they could be growing. So uh, again, uh, here's a picture of um, barley yellow dwarf virus. That's why we're, we're very concerned about our aphids. Uh, we have a lot of information about managing barley yellow dwarf virus. Austin and I and several others uh, put together this publication. Uh, you can um, get this off the www.aces.edu and read more about barley yellow dwarf virus. I'm not going to go into the details right now. Uh, I do want to point out that when we're out looking for aphids, aphids can look a little bit different sometimes because they do have wings on occasion. You can see all of these that have come in here um, had, have, have their wings on them, but there are also fully functioning adult aphids that don't have wings, and here are some pictures of some of those. So the bird cherry oat aphid is the primary vector, we believe, for barley yellow dwarf virus in our region, and rice root aphid can also bring in uh, barley yellow dwarf virus. Uh, other, other aphids um, also can occur, uh, but they, you're looking at these little, little sacks of goo, basically, and you can tell they're aphids because they have these little, most of them have these little tailpipes sticking out the back end, relatively long antennae, and um, so they are usually, kind of like clustered in herds because the mother, when she gives birth to her live young, she may sort of stay in the same place with her babies. Uh, so you often kind of see them if there's more than one aphid, you may kind of see them in a, almost like a little herd of cows and they're sucking insects. Their aphids are sometimes hard to scout for because they hang out on the undersides of the leaves or they're feeding down at the bases of the stem. In cold weather, they move down to the base of the plant and they may be actually down below ground. And when wheat is small, it's a long way down to get to that wheat. So it is sometimes hard to, hard to scout for because you've got to kind of crawl along and um, try, to, try, to see, try to see the aphids. So therefore, we basically try to predict the risk about having barley yellow dwarf virus from, from the work that we've done in previous years. Because it's often you know, not economical to scout the small grains as often as you would need to technically to try to figure out what was happening with the aphid populations. Uh, so we, we know that the earlier that wheat is infected, the greater the yield loss we're going to have from barley yellow dwarf and, and its uh, corresponding disease serial yellow dwarf virus. So we're worried about this thing mainly through the end of February, first part of March. Beyond that, there's no point in putting out an insecticide and trying to control the aphid spore to protect your yield from early yellow dwarf virus. They generally were worried about controlling those aphids early. So historically, we can make a few general recommendations, but of course this year when we everybody planned to light directed things sort of go out the window, but generally uh, our recommendations are if you're going to be uh, planting small grains during the recommended planting date for grains, uh, a seed treatment or a foliar spray 30 days after planting is gonna be what pays off uh, more, more often than not in North Alabama. Um, in South Alabama, it's generally that late winter spray, uh, late January, early February, either with or without fertilizer, um, seems to be when it's most likely to pay off. And with all of our late planted wheat, that's going to be the time to be applying a spray for barley yellow dwarf virus if you, if you have the money to sort of put on the spray. 
Central Alabama is in when we're planning normally in uh, late October, early November. Uh, it's got it could have time and be warm enough for substantial development in the fall as well as in the winter. So sometimes the optimum situation for Central Alabama may be to spray twice, and we really may not be able to afford that. But spraying either either 30 days after planting or um, it, as the aphids are picking up and starting to develop in the in the late winter. Um, Either one was better than not spraying at all, but two might be optimal. So um, again, with this late planting that we're looking at this year, where most everybody got got their got their plants in late, uh, we'd say that probably the, the we would recommend putting on a spray um, in late January or early February. Uh, barley yellow dwarf is one of our biggest, would you say, Austin sort of unrecognized disease problem that we have. Yeah, the symptoms are not real clear cut. That's Sim the problem. Right. In wheat, <clears throat> and wheat, oats and barley, it, it'll jump out at you. But in wheat, right. it's really hard to tell. So you could be having yield loss not knowing it, and by the time you see the symptoms, it's already spread. So this is why it's a tough thing. And so normally I don't tell people to put on sprays just on a routine basis. If anybody who knows me will know that. But this is one of the exceptions that I think that everybody, if you're going for high production wheat, ought to be putting on one spray for a barley yellow dwarf virus. And that we you know, sort of hedge our bets based on historical data when the best time to put that spray on is. Uh, having said that, if you can go out and look for wheat at, uh, in, in the wintertime, you may find that you've got an unexpected number of aphids, even though you did have already sprayed. Um, our thresholds are generally, if you're out looking, if uh, before the wheat has started to elongate, if you've got six aphids or more per square foot, per row foot, um, or once the stem's starting elongating, if you're finding two aphids per stem. Now, if you're gonna go out and scout for aphids, you wanna go out when the weather is nice, and that's for several reasons. The insects tend to be hiding, hunkered down when it's cold, and you're gonna be cranky, or at least I am, when I go out and try to look, scout for aphids. If it's 40 degrees and I'm freezing to death, I'm not gonna do a good job crawling on the ground counting those aphids, and you aren't either. So what you really want to do is uh, pick a nice day, you know, above 60 degrees. The insects will have crawled up if they're going to by the middle of the day. And that would be the time if you're going to go out and look for aphids, that would be the time to do it. Now, we have a new kid on the block, which is called Siphomatus. Uh, the common name we're hoping to be is going to be the hedgehog grain aphid, because this little aphid has got little spines all over it. Here's mama here, and these are all her babies. You see these little herd of, they, they kind of occur in herds. Um, generally, the babies are kind of amber colored. The, mo the mother is more blackish colored. And if you look at them with a hand lens or a mi microscope, you see that they are, they do have these hairs all over them. This is a new aphid. We know it's occurring throughout central Alabama. We don't know what, what kind of role it's gonna have in terms of making our burly yellow dwarf problem worse. So if anybody's out looking at their wheat and they happen to see this aphid, please let me know or one of your extension agents uh, let them know about this aphid. So uh, the other thing I want to talk about is that now's a good time to go out and just look at your wheat and assess the general health of the wheat. You want to be out and looking to see and hopefully we're not going to have problems with hessian fly. Hessian fly, like aphids, the earlier you plant, the more likely you're going to have a problem with this multi-generational insect, um, but it can occur on any different kind of planting date. What you want to be looking for is you just want to start looking for plants that just don't look right. So I want to point out that so it's so, sort of your normal wheat, it looks like the, here's one, here's the sick plant right here. Can you see how this leaf, the base of the, the middle part of this leaf blade here on this plant is just bare, is not even above the ground here. So it looks like the leaf blade is sticking right out of the ground. That's just, it's just not growing right. When you go out and you look at a field that's infested with hessian fly, that's going to be probably be your first assessment is this field just doesn't look right. <clears throat> here's some more, here's a close up. You can see how these leaf blades look like they're kind of coming out of the ground. They're kind of bunched together. And they're kind of a blue-green, kind of dull, greasy color. Here's a nice, clean, happy plant over here with the leaves coming out. And we see the, the leaf sheath comes out here, and then the leaf blade sticks out. I think those are the terms. Uh, here's another one. Can you see that wide blue leaf blade there? Kind of a thin stand. 
again, wide blue leaf blade coming right out of the ground, that's a sign that that plant's stunted and not growing right. Chances are the problem is going to be um, hessian fly, although lesser corn star borer can also have this look. So this is what you want to have. You want to have your, your, you know, your plants, uh, leaf uh, sheets coming out of the ground and kind of, but here, here the leaf blades are coming right there at ground level. Just doesn't look right. Here's another one. Here's another one here. Here's Rudy uh, Yates out there in a field that was heavily infested with hessian fly. And one of the problems that you can get when it attacks early is it can kill the plants outright. Especially it's a cold snap. They finish them off if they're kind of lingering on and weaken from hessian fly. So this is a field that was, was badly damaged, um, very thin stand. This is what the hessian fly looks like. If you start looking, you're going to be pulling your leaf sheet away from the base of the plant and start looking for the larvae, which are these little white things with a green line going through them. Or these are the pupil stage right here. Here's another example just kind of showing you here are the, uh, here are the larvae. Here are the, here are the pupae that were, we pulled the leaf seed away and there they were, there was a bunch of them. So how these got down here is that the adult hessian fly uh, lays her eggs on the leaf blade and then that little maggot hatches, it hatches out and crawls slowly down and in down behind the leaf sheet that goes down as far as it can go. So before joining occurs, it's going to go right down to the base of the plant as far as it can go behind that leaf sheet. Once the plant starts to joint and this little maggot is crawling its way down, it gets stuck at the joint. So as later in the season, the, the hessian fly infestation and where you'd be looking for hessian fly will change just because it, that, you know, they, the infestation proceeds further up the plant uh, in, in, as the, uh, the plant grows. So here's just, you know, here's the point. Wheat just doesn't look right. On the back, here's a resistant variety here uh, that's growing nicely. And here's a variety here that's badly infested with hessian fly. And you can see that there are very few heads out there. Here's some real life examples out there in, the, in, in some fields, unfortunately. We had a bad epidemic somewhere around 2009, 2010. Most of these pictures are from that time. Uh, you, again, this, this wheat just doesn't look right. Lots of dead tillers, that's another sign later on. The thin sparse stand and the dead tillers are, are, are signs of hessian fly. Uh, stunted plants, wheat isn't supposed to be this thin or this short. Uh, it was just a bad hessian fly year. This is what the adult looks like. It looks like a lot of other flies. So if we have them in a pheromone trap uh, that's with, with something attracting the adult flies and we have just a few flies on that trap, we can kind of pick out what they look like. Little beaded antennae here and uh, long legs like a mosquito. Uh, one thing is that when they, when they bleed, they bleed red. And I'm pointing this out just because it was, this is a sad little uh, fly that was trying to get off this you know, sticky trap and it, 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 it tore its foot off and it bled this little red hemo with its blood. But red, that's just a sign. Uh, I want everybody to kind of remember their red color. Anyway, those adults come out, they lay the eggs in the leaves, uh, the eggs uh, hatch, Little maggots go down at the bottom of the plant. The problem is, is that when we're trying to control hessian fly, they are protected in the plant for most of their life, so it's really hard to spray them with a foliar insecticide. All we can do is try to get the adults, when they're out flying around and laying eggs, the eggs or the little maggots as they are hatching from the egg and crawling down the rest of that leaf blade to go behind the leaf sheath. So we have a relatively narrow window if we had try to spray for hessian fly. Uh, rescue may be possible, but we're best going to be controlling hessian fly by decisions that are made before planting. And I'm just going to go through these briefly. Um, it's a long list. All of these are just designed to reduce your problems. Avoid continuous planting of wheat in the same field because the uh, pupae over summer in the field. So if you come right back in the next fall, they're going to say, thank you, I'm here and ready, and thank you for putting wheat back in my field. So like the hessian fly resistant variety, Control the volunteer wheat, which can be allowing the uh, uh, flies to build up early in the, in the fall, like in September. Don't plant your wheat before the recommended planting date. If you're going to use grazing, try to plant rye, oats, or a hessian fly resistant wheat, because generally all these grazing things are planted early. That can allow uh, the hessian flies to build up early and then fly into the wheat produced for grain. Uh, as an entomologist, I love plowing. 
uh, to vary the wheat debris, especially right after harvest. Uh, lots of people can't do that, but if you can, uh, that kind of varies those, uh, those pupae. Don't use the susceptible wheat for wildlife planting. I think this is pretty huge because wildlife plantings are put in early. And uh, what can happen is that the, um, you can build up your hessian flies early. That picture of Rudy Yates out there in that wheat field, that wheat is out in an area where there's lots of little wildlife plots scattered around that build up the hessian fly and it's sort of a chronic hot spot. Um, if you're gonna grow a susceptible wheat, consider using a high rate of an insecticide seed treatment or um, spraying the foliar insecticide at the two leaf stage to try to control that early, early infestation, which is the most devastating. Those are some of the IPM recommendations we have. But if you get to the point at this time of year, you go out in your field and you say, this wheat just doesn't look right. Well then start trying to think about how many of these tillers don't look right. Start pulling the leaves back and looking for the flies. And if you've got a thin stand or if you've got more than 20% of your tillers that are infested, with the hessian fly, your yield potential is seriously compromised for that field. Because we're not only talking about what's already happened, but the fact that there can be another generation of the hessian fly coming along. So that nitrogen application may not pay off. So the decision might just be to think about um, just saying, I'm not gonna harvest this field. So, or I'm not gonna put the nitrogen application on. I'm gonna save my inputs and just harvest it for hay or, or, or something. So. That's one thing to think about is, 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 is at this time of year is, um, am, I, am I so badly infested that it's not worth going on? Now, it may be possible, and so we've had some luck here, and there's some data from uh, North Carolina years ago that you might be able to rescue a field. If you go out at this time of year and you find you've got some maggots or you've got some pupae in the field and it's you know five, 10% or even 20, and, and, but you're really, Think that this field's got potential in terms of being a good stand <clears throat> and you're willing to go out a couple times a week while during this stage right now or you know and keep an eye on the development of the hessian flies so they don't always they're not always all on the same stage but they are sort of pretty much clustered so when you go out you're probably going to find they're either like late stage maggots or their pupae now you're gonna to wanna to spray the pyrethroid insecticide when these adults are starting to emerge. How do you know when the adults are starting to emerge when they look like every other little fly out there in the field? Well, what you can do is you can, you can squeeze the pupae. So you see these brown things here. If you squeeze this and it's mostly white, it means that it's close to being in this stage, this larval stage. This is the stage where it transformed from the larval to the, the adult. But if you squeeze this pupa and it's pink, you remember how I showed you that picture of that hessian fly adult on the trap with the little bleeding, the little pink hemolymph? When you're squeezing these pupae and they're starting to be pink, that's a sign they're getting closer to the adult stage and they're more likely to be, they're about to be coming out. That's the time when the pupae are pink to kind of start looking for some eggs on the plant too. Once you maybe want to see a few of the eggs or once you just start seeing that these pupae are turning pink, um, a little, uh, wait a few days and then that would be a good time to put on this rescue high retroid spray if you're gonna try to do that in the field. Here's a picture of the eggs. They're kind of hard to see. They kind of glisten. They're about 1 32nd of an inch long. Um, takes about three to five days for them to hatch. So you see, if you start seeing them, seeing some eggs there on the, field, on, on the leaves, I think if you spray, uh, that residue of the insecticide is gonna be on there and as these little larvae are making their way down, they're gonna be impacted by that. So um, that's if you're gonna try to do a rescue spray for your hessian fly. So there's a lot of information about this. Um, if you go to www.asus.edu or you go to, to, to alabamacrops.com, just search on hessian fly. And what you're gonna be looking for, we have a fact sheet on the hessian fly and we also have a timely information sheet on how to scout for the hessian fly in, this, in the winter time. There will be some more information for you. So um, here's a fact sheet that, that I was talking about that you can find. And um, does anybody have any questions? One of the things you mentioned, uh, game food plots and wheat, mm -hmm. would be better if we encourage people to grow uh, oats or would uh, maybe rye be a better 
choice rather as an early. Player, I think so. Yes, as rather, far as fashion rather fly. than playing wheat. You know. Yeah, I think so. As far as, as as fashion fly, especially in these areas or, or spots where there just seems to be a chronic hot spot for. It would help with bar, but not with it would have, might make Burley Eldorf worse. That's the only problem yeah, with those. Not, not but they're sort of a host, host for all the small grains are a host for Burley Eldorf. Yeah, I think. It does, yeah. So I, I think it may not matter if they're going to plant early. Matters, yeah. But I don't, I don't like seeing wheat planted early for, yeah. particularly for hessian flies. They go out with a, I would think, a susceptible variety and have a large buildup yeah. on September planted wheat. And, and then you. Well, as you said before, and then you have wheat fields in the general vicinity. You're just flooding them with flies, that and even if they're resistant, you're you're pushing. Yeah, you're, you're you're putting, putting pressure, pressure on, on that resistance. That's right. So it's all a numbers game with hessian fly. It's just that you know how much pressure are we going to have? And one thing that Brenda Ortiz found out, uh, working with some historical data from David Button, uh, was that there are certain years that are going to be more conducive to having problems with hessian fly. So the La Nina phase of El Nino. Uh, where we're going to get that warmer, drier winter, it's going to be favorable. And also, what was very critical is if there's some rain going on in the in the in the early fall, and from anywhere from late August to early October, if there's rain during that time. And the biological reason for that is because if you get rain at that time, it's a signal for those um, hessian flies that were oversummering in that pupil stage for those adults to emerge and come out and start the generation. So those are sort of two times. We know, so if you're thinking, um, if you want to know when the greatest risk is going to be, it's going to be in those La Nina years when we have a little bit of, when we have some rain. This year we had, didn't have rain during that period, so that's one thing that sort of led to a, uh, probably a lower infestation and a lower risk from Hessian fly this year, even though we're technically, I think we're in the La Nina phase, so it's going to be sort of warmer and drier. You wouldn't know it from how much rain we've had in the last week or so.